I remember a while back I was watching this video by Joey where he was examining some of the high stakes play and kind of what the state of high stakes play looks like with the advent of solver technology and he was really blown away by a lot of these hands and while I think that he was actually stoned during the video I think that a lot of the seemingly nonsensical maniacal play that you see at the high stakes actually gets pretty justified once you see what a solver is teaching you and kind of makes sense from a theoretical perspective so today we're definitely going to look at some hands that the solvers are going to disagree with and kind of talk about what implications must be going on underneath in order to make some of these wild plays acceptable if you are someone who has a solver and you're not really sure what inputs to put in, if you have good preflop ranges, very often looking to high stakes games is a good resource for figuring out what are good bet sizings and strategies that you can go and explore yourself. So you should be frequently looking at high stakes games and high stakes replays yourself and not just be focusing on concepts that are directly relevant to your game. But anyways, so let's look at one of the gods of No Limit, OTB Red Baron, at a hand that he is playing at 5100. So it folds around to him in the small blind, he 3x's it and give me up 3 bets, and OTB goes ahead and flats. So in this hand we know give me up has jack 10, OTB has king 10, and so these are going to be pretty standard plays for both players. Here in this model, Jack-10 suited is definitely going to be a 3-bet with some frequency of the time. As you can see, the in-position player should be 3-betting with some frequency with a wide range of hands in order to get some kind of board coverage. But also, there should be a bunch of hands that you should be flatting almost 100% of the time because they just play so well as a flat, such as Ace-8 suited, Queen-9 suited, etc. Of course, this is assuming that OTB is just playing a raising or fold range and that he does not ever limp the small blind. Maybe he does, I actually don't know. Out of position, OTB should have a lot of his stronger suited hands. He should 4-bet a little bit of his worse hands from every category. But so many of these hands play well to a 3-bet that he shouldn't actually be mixing their action, he should just be flatting 100% of the time. So the flop comes a7-2, OTB red baron checks, as he should with virtually his entire range on an ace high board because give me up is going to have the huge nuts advantage here and then give me up goes ahead and bets 30 percent here which he could do with a polarized range which will have him betting like 70 to 80 percent of the time here or he can be doing this with a completely depolarized range very very high stakes these guys are definitely capable of having a slight slight check back range on an a7-2 board but definitely when you have a hand like jack 10 of spades you block ace jack and ace 10 which are very likely hands that otb red baron is going to continue with you have two backdoor draws and you have a little bit of equity when you turn a jack or a 10 against your opponents like seven pocket eights pocket nines etc and here otb calls with king 10 of clubs after otb checks give me up range bets you can see that king 10 of clubs is a hundred percent call here and generally, when you have the double back doors, you should be continuing, and when you have diamond type hands, you should be giving up a little bit more frequently. So OTB calls. The turn is a king of hearts, which is again a card that should really favor give me ups range. So I imagine that if he has to pick two sizings between small and large, he's generally going to pick a larger size because the king is so good for him. OTB checks again, and give me up bets about two thirds of the pot, setting up an effective river shove. Obviously, if you call the flop with king 10, thinking that your showdown equity might be good, then you definitely need to call when you turn your king. So, OTB calls. And here on the king of hearts turn, after he checks and his opponent has to choose between two sizes, clearly Pio prefers betting three quarters over a third. And after the large bet, king 10 is gonna be a quick snap. The river's the nine of clubs and OTB red baron has no real reason to lead here. Maybe he could lead a little bit if the River was an ace, a seven, or possibly a king, but probably not even a king. OTB checks, and give me up just puts it in. OTB calls, and well, just ruins, <laughs> gives me up's life. So how good is this call? Seems pretty thin. On a river nine of clubs after you check and your opponent jams, yeah, it looks like king ten of clubs is 
just going to be a fold 100% of the time. And if you're going to pick a king to call with, you'd prefer to call with king-queen a little bit because king-queen blocks ace-queen, which is definitely one of the hands that your opponent is going to triple barrel for value here. So in order to make this profitable, OTB essentially has to have the read that Villain is going to be bluffing often enough to make all of his bluff catchers profitable. And when we look at the river here, Jack-10 suited from Give Me Up Shoes is not always going to be an automatic jam. So if this is a spot where Give Me Up is always going to be barreling his Queen Jack, Queen 10, Jack 10 hands, etc. and might be just kind of heavy on those bluffs, this might be a spot where calling off with King 10 is going to be fine, even though you hold a 10 which blocks a lot of your opponent's triple barrels on the river. And so when you're watching players play at these very high stakes and you see them deviating, you can't just assume that they're randomly pressing buttons for tens of thousands of dollars. They clearly have to be doing something that is not directly obvious from Pile Solver. And so it's always important to think, hey, why are they actually doing this? What kind of exploit are they assuming in their opponent? And indeed here, if OTB's read is that Give Me Up is always just going to be blasting off with all of his gut shots that missed, well then indeed this call is going to be good. But also, man, you have to have a pretty sick and esoteric read in order to be able to make this call profitable. And so this definitely speaks to the level of attention that these players are playing with if somehow OTB can deduce from his hand histories with this opponent that he's going to be bluffing the river too often. So this is definitely going to be an example where one of the gods of poker, True Teller himself, seems to get really out of line when you compare it to GTO. Let's take a look. Barry Sweet, one of the kings of high stakes heads up, opens on the small blind and gets flatted by True Teller. The flop comes to 9-3 and True Teller checks as he probably does with his entire range. And then Barry Sweet goes ahead and bets 575. This is a spot where if you have to bet 30%, you probably can do so 75-80% of the time. So if you simplified this to 100, you'd probably be like losing $12 in a 1920 pot. So it's not actually going to be a huge difference in EV. And then True Teller goes ahead and raises it up to 2400. So with 75 with the 7 of spades here, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is pretty dicey. 6-5 with one spade is obviously way better. And basically, when you check-raise a hand like 7-5, you're really hoping it's going to come runner-runner, but very often, even when it comes like perfect runner-runner, you're still not going to make a very strong hand. So, for example, when you have a 7-5 and then it comes like ace-4 and you get a straight, well... <laughs> With a four card straight out there, it might not be the easiest to get action. Although, this is heads up and these guys are very aggressive, so, you know, I'm sure that they'll get action in all sorts of spots. Here, when we look at Pile Solver, after a check and then a range bet, definitely a bunch of hands should go ahead and start check raising the flop. A lot of them are going to be like the 9x hands, particularly Ace-9, King-9, Queen-9, which are intending to play for stacks. The flush draws are going to mix based on how much top pair equity they have. For example, hands like Ace-8, which has two live cards to pairs that can probably show down, it's probably going to call more, while a hand like King-5 of spades or Queen-5 of spades might not be able to show down as often when it hits a 5, so those hands are going to be raises a little bit more often. However, 7-5 here, yeah, that's just going to be a fold. It's really going to be a tiny, tiny minority raise here. So let's just keep that in mind. It's not absolutely terrible to raise here some tiny percentage of the time, but it's really not that recommended by the solver. Ace three here, you're gonna call, obviously gonna pretty much call when you have any nine, two, or three, as well as when you have front door and back door flush draws. On the turn eight, True Teller goes ahead and bets about 75% of the pot, and then he gets called again by ace three. So, the 8 is probably not a very good card for a True Teller's range. I think he can never have pocket 8s here, while Barry Sweet definitely can. An 8 shouldn't theoretically improve the equity of a lot of hands, except for possibly like Jack 10 or Queen 10 that check raised the flop that has, has a single spade. And so generally, this is a pretty good turn to start slowing down on. 
particularly when our opponent can have all of the pocket nines and pocket eights, even though, you know, in wide, wide versus wide situations, you're not really worried about your opponent having sets that often. You can have a little bit of 9-8 that check raises the flop, but again, Barry Sweet should have the majority of the nuts here. Here on the 8 of diamonds, we can see that True Teller should basically be giving up on a lot of his bluffs. Even when he has a hand like King-5 of spades, these hands can give up on the turn and start check calling, giving you kind of a defended check calling range on the river when spades come out. And you can see here, indeed, when you have like Queen-10 or Queen-Jack with a spade that check raised the flop, you should go ahead and continue firing on the turn. If we make this proportional to weight, you'll see that most of our range is just going to be like 9x, a couple of these like over cards that had two back doors on the flop. But of the combinations of 7-5 that continues here, almost all of them give up, despite the 8 being one of the best cards for our hand. So definitely getting out of line here by betting 508 here from True Teller. No reason to really ever fold Ace-3 here, so as you can see, Barry Sweet just goes ahead and calls. And here on the River Four of Spades, True Teller goes ahead and bets about three quarters of the pot again. And let's see what Barry Sweet should do. You know, when the Four of Diamond comes, I suspect the hands that are now going to start firing off are going to be some bluffs with an ace, mostly bluffs with a five, and then a little bit of bluffs when you hold a six X type hand, but mostly when you have a five, you should start blasting this river. And as you can see here, almost all of the five X's uh, become good river bluffs. And one of the reason the five X is the best hand to bluff is because the five can be part of two straights with both ace five and five six. So it's like the most likely hand to block your opponent's nut type hands. And so holding a five X is going to be the primary factor in whether or not you want to size up on the river because when you know when you shove you're trying to block all the 5x type hands from your opponent if you bet a smaller size eh, you're not really trying to block straights as importantly so you should try to be blocking hand, like 9x type hands so you want to have like queen 10 jack 10 etc so he shoves and here on the river ace 3 and ace 3 offsuit seem to be pretty obvious calls especially because you block ace 5 so Barry Sweet calls on the river, and True Teller kind of gets wrecked. So I think it's really interesting that despite True Teller being such a well-known high-stakes player, that GTO definitely, definitely does not agree with his flop play. And I think that this flop check raise definitely gets pretty thin and makes Ace-3 a pretty mandatory call down if your opponent is check raising this lightly. Let's finish this up by looking at a hand between the masters, Linus Love and Barry Sweet. Linus opens pocket fours to 2.5x, and then Barry Sweet 4x's it from the blinds. A little bit more than 4x. And Linus defends. So, pretty standard here to be 3 betting with King Queen here. Pretty standard for Linus to be defending with pocket fours. On the flop, Barry Sweet goes ahead and pots it, and obviously now hitting bottom set, Linus is going to start start with at least a call. Here, if you give Barry Sweet the option between two sizings, definitely it's going to occasionally just go ahead and pot the flop. Usually the hands that it's going to want to pot here are going to be hands that want to kind of reduce this to a two street game. So ace, nine, tens, jacks are the hands that really want to put the money in now because if it puts the money in now it think it, it thinks it's going to be good and these hands really really can stand a lot of protection in order to balance this you occasionally are going to be betting when you have like some broadway type hands some double back doors but even when you have hands like spades usually your spade hands are going to just go ahead and make the smaller sizing so you're really reserving these kind of overbet bluffs for hands that don't really mind getting jammed on and you generally have to have a little bit of coverage here. In a vacuum, king-queen, not really often one of the hands that you want to go ahead and pot here, but it's possible that another equilibria where perhaps we're only using one size or where we use two different sizes will show that we should be betting king-queen more often here, or possibly Barry Sweet has some kind of simplification where in his brain he can automatically identify which broadways he wants to go ahead and turn into the overbet bluffing combinations. But if you're not using any simplification, you're trying to just raw mimic 
what GTO is doing here, yeah, it's probably going to recommend using a smaller size you're checking very often. But let's start with a pot size bet. And when we look, pocket fours is never going to be a raise here in a three bet pot with such little SPR. You can see that there's absolutely no reason to raise threes, fours, and nines here. And you'll see that this is often true in three bet pots is that when you have a set and a guy just blasts it, there's no real reason to raise because he's just going to go ahead and put the money in. Ace-9, however, is an automatic raise, so this is going to be a spot that might be counterintuitive to some players where they'll always flat Ace-9 and always jam 9s in order to try to stack like kings, but it actually it should be the opposite where you always jam Ace-9 and always flat 9s. So Linus calls. The turn is a 3 of hearts, which really should not improve Barry's sweet hand that much because he should not have that many 3x hands, but Linus should have a handful of like ace-3, 4-3, 5-3, etc. And here, Barry goes for the very, very small sizing. If you look at the SPRs, you'll see that Barry could just make this a two-street game and just go ahead and shove the turn. And I imagine there will be some turns that he just goes ahead and open shoves. In fact, on the three of hearts turn, when you give Pio the option of just jamming or not jamming, it pretty much just makes it a two-street game with all of these aces, with all of these nines, jacks and tens, and just tries to put your opponent into kind of a nasty situation, where when he's got like pocket eights, he's put into a kind of gross spot, because he really doesn't want to fold it, because this board seems to be really good for pocket eights, but, he's, but he really doesn't want to get stacked on a board where he shouldn't have that many nuts advantages here. So here, it shows that if we ha use two bet sizes, we're going to prefer the larger one. So let's go ahead and create a subtree configuration and just allow the out of position to player to bet 27 here and just see how this will change things. And we'll see that he should be betting the majority of the range to be setting up a river shove. I imagine if he bets here and there's a call on a river blank, there's just going to be a ton of shoves. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of shoves on the river. The idea being you've really capped your opponent by the river so you can now shove very, very widely. And it's just going to make his life really, really difficult because he'll have a very loose range by the river. Well, not very loose because you potted the flop and he called, but he should still be loose enough that you can just jam a lot of hands. But here, however, even if you bet only the size, if you have a hand like King Queen, generally likes to just check the turn here because this turn is not very good for you. So we bet and we see that now with a full house, nines, fours, and threes, are obviously just going to be flats again. In fact, there's pretty much just no raises in this range here. The River Ace is a hand that should be pretty good for Barry in terms of having pure nuts advantages here. There definitely should be a, a couple Ace Xs that he can represent here. And as you can see, for the most part, we should just be betting a bunch of our Ace X hands that somehow got there by the river. We should just go ahead and jam tens, jacks, queens, and kings for value and just put our opponent into a really difficult spot by shoving a bunch of aces and slightly worse so it's not like he can hero us with a bunch of hands. And on this run out, if you are Linus, how many hands do you have that actually can call down here, right? You know, I mean, you probably have Ace-5, Ace-2, a couple Ace-Queens, a couple Ace-Jacks. King Queen, however, is a check by this river, and after you check and Linus jams, yeah, generally should just be going ahead and folding King Queen. So, Barry Sweet checks the river, giving up, and Linus jams, and then Barry Sweet calls! Oh, what? And he gets shown the terrible news! Oh man, what does he think is going on here? Let's take a look. So this is what Linus's shoving range should look like by the river. When we look at it proportionally, he should be shoving all of his busted spades, the few non-spade combos of King Queen and King Jack that he has. But this is a spot that really recommends that Linus gives up when he has a hand like 6-5 or Queen-5 of spades. So there actually really aren't that many combinations of bluffs to even add in by the river. But let's see what happens if we add in a couple more. So we've given Linus about 10% more bluffs than optimal or 20% proportionally to his range and if we set the strategy now that we've given Linus 20% more bluffs does this allow us to call down with King Queen indeed King Queen does become a call so this is going to be a spot where like we saw with the OTB Red Baron hand if we think that our opponent is just naturally going to be turning a lot of these kind of low bluffing hands into shoves with 100% frequency then uh, we need to expand our calling range to be calling down with some kind of king-queen type hands, but obviously the downside of this is that this really exposes us to the times that our opponent has pocket fours. 
So, can't really comment too much about the internal metagame that is going on between Barry Sweet and Linus Love, but what I can say is, in order to make some of these crazy calls profitable, it must imply that your opponents are indeed over bluffing in some spots. So, so when you're watching these games and you see, wow, these calls seem really crazy, it's mostly because one player suspects the other player is indeed crazy and they're just closing their eyes and calling down when their blockers are appropriate. So hopefully this was a helpful review for you. As you can see, these hands were played on September 19th, so these are extremely recent hands between some of the best players in the world, and I'm always excited to see what new technology these guys are going to be coming up with. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Please like and subscribe, it always really helps a lot. And if you're interested in all the simplification work that I've been doing, please check out my cash game system at OvernightMonster.com. And otherwise, good luck.